this is my book, obviously, Rise of the Warrior Cop. Um, and uh, I wrote this, uh, well, actually, I wrote a paper for the Cato Institute 2006 uh, based on, uh, the book is sort of uh, an expansion of, uh, and I wrote that paper because I, when I was at Cato, I was covering uh, the Civil Liberties beat, and I kept reading these stories about uh, botched raids where police would break into the wrong house. Uh, and inevitably, these stories would end with a police spokesman saying, this is an isolated incident, this almost never happens. Uh, and you read enough stories about isolated incidents, and you start to wonder how isolated they actually are. Um, so I started looking into the issue and was pretty horrified by what I found. I uh, wrote the Cato paper and sort of stayed on this issue for the next few years. Uh, we actually tried to get a book published a couple times and couldn't find any publishers that were interested. Uh, and interestingly enough, it was the... Um, the crackdowns on the Occupy movement a couple years ago that really kind of thrust this issue back into the public eye and actually got publishers interested, uh, and hence my book. So this is Katherine Johnston. A lot of you may know this story. Uh, Katherine Johnston was a 92-year-old uh, woman <clears throat> who lived in Atlanta, uh, a particularly bad section of Atlanta. And uh, one afternoon around Thanksgiving, week of Thanksgiving in 2006, there was a narcotics team from the Atlanta Police Department out <clears throat> sort of driving around. Uh, they saw a guy walking alongside the road that they had arrested several times previously on various drug charges, knew he had a rap sheet. Uh, so they jumped out on him, threw him on the ground, put a gun to his head, and we now know, uh, planted a bag of marijuana on him. They then asked him where, well, basically they said, you know, we know you have a record, you know you have a record, you're going to go away for a long time unless you can tell us where we can find a significant supply of drugs. So he made up an address, basically just to get him off his back, uh, and the address happened to be that of Katherine Johnston. Um, now what's supposed to happen at this point is the police are supposed to do what they call a controlled drug buy. They're supposed to get a confidential informant uh, to wear a wire, possibly give him some marked bills, go send him to the house to buy some drugs. Then they go and get their search warrant uh, from a judge and then they conduct their drug raid. Uh, the problem is that could take two or three days and they didn't want to wait that long. Uh, I guess the drug stashes can be moved from place to place pretty quickly. So they lied. Uh, they made up an informant, uh, lied on the search warrant affidavit. Uh, for those of you who watched The Wire, uh, Fuzzy Dunlop is the, uh, the name of uh, the phantom informant that police officers use, the non-existent informant. Uh, so they lied on the search warrant. They got their, uh, they uh, lied on the affidavit. They got their search warrant within a few hours. Uh, it was actually literally uh, rubber stamped by a judge who had a rubber stamp of her signature just for drug warrants because she saw so many over the course of the day. Uh, and within a few hours, they were breaking down Katherine Johnston's door. Katherine Johnston woke up to the sound of people breaking into her home. She had an old rusty revolver she kept by her bed to scare people off. Again, this was a bad neighborhood, and she had bars on the door. Uh, when they finally got the bars down and, uh, and came into her living room, she was standing there greeting them, uh, holding her revolver. Police opened fire, uh, shot her several times. Uh, they initially said that she shot first. We now know that was a lie. Um, the revolver that she had didn't work. And after they shot her, a couple of the officers ended up, uh, the bullets ricocheted and hit a couple of the officers. Uh, they called for two ambulances for the two wounded officers. Um, they did not call an ambulance for Katherine Johnston. Instead, they left her to bleed to death on her own living room floor, handcuffed, uh, while well, one officer went down to the basement to plant the marijuana that they were going to say their informant bought off of her. Well, now they realize that they're going to have to cover their tracks, right? Uh, they're going to have to find an informant who's going to say he was the informant on the search warrant. So they go to this guy that they've used in the past, and, you know, informants tend to be pretty shady characters. They're either addicts themselves, rival drug dealers, people who are trying to get their own criminal charges uh, dismissed. Uh, and to its credit, uh, this informant would not play along. Uh, there's this amazing 911 call that you can, you can actually find the audio still on the internet, uh, where he calls 911 from the back of an Atlanta squad car and says, uh, uh, sort of amusingly, give me the FBI. And uh, he goes on to say that uh, they're trying to say that, that, that I helped them kill that old lady and I'm not going to play along with that. The police officers who were pressuring him uh, overhear the conversation, uh, at some point, he realizes that he's about to be threatened, so he jumps out of the car and starts running. There's this incredible chase through downtown Atlanta where they're chasing him through, you know, businesses and the lobby of a hotel. Uh, he finally finds a phone. He was working as an informant with the ATF at the time as well. 
He calls his handler at the ATF, who then swoops in with a car, picks him up, and drives him off into the suburbs. They put him up in a hotel, uh, and now we've got a full-blown scandal. So there's a federal civil rights investigation, and what they found was that what happened in the Katherine Johnson case was rampant at the Atlanta Police Department. Uh, the lying on the search warrants was common, the wrong door raids. Uh, in fact, the Atlanta City Council held hearings uh, about a month later, uh, and literally dozens of people came forward to say that they had also been wrongly raided by an Atlanta narcotics team, uh, including one woman who lived a few doors down from Katherine Johnson, who was in her 80s, uh, who also kept a uh, fake gun by her bed to scare people off. Uh, they managed to hold, her fire, hold their fire in that case. The other thing that the federal investigation found is that uh, the Atlanta, the narcotics cops in Atlanta all had quotas. They had to arrest so many people per month. They had to seize a minimum quantity of drugs each month. Uh, and there was enormous pressure on them to meet, their, meet this quota. Uh, their job performance reviews, their, ra their raises, their promotions were dependent on them meeting these quotas. So there was a lot of pressure on them to uh, take basically a, a lot of incentive for them to take shortcuts uh, instead of you know, following the constitutional uh, the protocols that, that comply with the Constitution when conducting these raids. Um, the Atlanta, this was not in the federal investigation, but uh, the Atlanta Police Department itself uh, had a sort of quota uh, because the department was, was competing with every police department, every other police department in the country for a uh, limited series of federal grants that were directly tied to drug policing. Uh, these are grants that every police department in the country competes for. Uh, and it provides a strong incentive for police departments to prioritize drug policing over uh, crimes that have actual victims. Uh, now, you could argue that maybe Atlanta was the only police department in the country where this was happening and just happened to be the one police department that got caught. It seems a little naive, uh, given that these incentives that caused these trickle-down incentive problems uh, exist for every police department in the country, it's a safe bet that this was happening elsewhere. Uh, and in fact, there have been other uh, botched raids and innocent people killed in raids and subsequent investigations that showed us that uh, this has, in fact, happened elsewhere. I, I open with the Katherine Johnson story because it really embodies sort of everything that's wrong with this issue. Um, and so now I'm going to get into a little bit of history. Uh, the book goes into far more extensive history. Uh, but this is a quote that's commonly uh, attributed to Winston Churchill, although I actually can't find any proof that he said it. Uh, but it was a, a sentiment that was common in the Cold War era, right? This is, this is what distinguishes us from the Eastern Bloc countries, right? From, uh, from East Germany and the Stasi, right? In, in democracies and free societies, uh, the government does not send men, armed men and dressed in black to kick down your door in the morning. And, you know, I would submit that not only have we gotten far away from this sentiment, uh, it's actually worse than this, right? Because a lot of times they don't even bother to knock. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this term. Um, and again, there's a, a more extensive history behind this term, but uh, basically this is the sentiment that is long held in this country, in the United States, that uh, we need to keep a firm wall between police and the military. They have two very different missions. Um, the job of the military is to annihilate a foreign enemy, it's to kill people and break things. Uh, the job of a police officer is to protect, to, uh, to, uh, protect and serve, right? To keep the peace, to protect our constitutional rights. Uh, it's dangerous to conflate these two ideas. And to be honest, for most of American history, we've actually done a pretty good job of keeping the military out of domestic policing. And in fact, one of the institutions that's done, that, that, that seems to hold the posse comitatus value most dear is the military itself. Um, there have been a number of periods in, in American history where some stupid politicians uh, have tried to bring the military into domestic policing, uh, most notably in the 1980s with Reagan and some members of Congress actually wanted to bring active duty troops in to start conducting drug raids and doing drug arrests. Uh, and it was actually the resistance from the military uh, that held, held this up. This was testimony before Congress by uh, Thomas Olstead, who at the time I think was either number two or number three man at the Pentagon. Uh, and this was him pushing back against this idea. And it was bipartisan. Leaders from both parties were trying to bring the military in to fight the drug war. Uh, and to his, you know, again, to their credit, it was the military that really pushed back on this, and this, you can, I won't read the quote to you, but Olstead is basically warning that when you bring the military in to do civilian policing, uh, you, you basically bring about an end to civil free societies. We've done a good job keeping the military out of domestic policing. Uh, what my book argues, and what the rest of this uh, talk will argue, 
uh, is that we've done a poor job of uh, guarding our flanks, so to speak, to borrow some military terminology. Um, we've allowed and even encouraged uh, our domestic police officers to become more like the military. Uh, when it comes to how they approach their job, how they see uh, the citizens that they interact with, uh, the kinds of tactics they use, uh, you know, if our police officers see themselves as soldiers, if our elected officials are telling them they're soldiers, uh, if the citizen sees them as basically an occupying force, uh, there's really no difference uh, between domestic police acting as soldiers and having actual soldiers uh, patrolling in the streets. Uh, and in fact, uh, well, I'll get into this a little bit later, but there's actually, uh, I, I actually have come to the, come, come to the opinion that uh, it may actually be quite a bit worse, that in some places we would actually probably be better with the military patrolling the streets uh, than the police officers that we have now. Um, so we're going to play a little game. This is called Copper Soldier. So I'm going to show you a photo, uh, and you're going to tell me if it's a cop or a soldier. Uh, now, all these photos are from uh, police officers in the United States, work for a police agency in the U.S., or uh, an American soldier. So let's go to the first slide. Copper soldier. That's a cop. Next. Soldiers. Next. Yeah, I gave it away with the star on the sleeve there. Next one. Ah, everybody misses that one. Those are cops. Next. Cops. Next. Soldiers. Soldiers. That is an Oregon State Trooper. So, this is a cop, by the way. Um, <laughs> So a little more history, um, it's really in the late 60s, mid to late 60s, early 70s when we start to see the kind of modern era of police militarization. Uh, and there are two trends that are going on that start in the late 60s. Uh, the first is the rise of the SWAT team, uh, and that's thanks to this fellow, uh, Daryl Gates. Um, Gates was in charge of LAPD's reaction or, or response to the Watts riots in 1965. And the Watts riots were unlike anything this country had ever seen before. Um, most of the time when there had been riots, they would be isolated in one part of the city. The Watts riots, although they're named the Watts riots, actually spread well beyond Watts. Uh, and Gates actually thought that it was more like a, a kind of urban uh, guerrilla warfare, uh, that there were snipers that were picking off you know, firemen who were going to put out fires that rioters had started. Um, it was really a, um, uh, to Gates, it was a, a pretty terrifying uh, situation. Uh, and he thought that LAPD did not have an adequate way of responding to this kind of civil unrest. And of course, this was a time in, in our history when it was reasonable to assume that there was going to be a lot more of this. So Gates got this idea of putting together an elite, highly trained team of police officers who could be summoned on a moment's notice and use basically overwhelming force uh, to put down a threat, similar to the way you know, special forces uh, do in the military. Uh, he actually consulted with some Marines at Camp, Pen Camp Pendleton and came up with this idea of, of putting together this, this assault team. Um, what's interesting is he actually brought the idea to Chief William Parker at the time, and Parker turned him down. Uh, Parker said that this idea uh, tread too close to the line between uh, civilian police and the military. Uh, it wasn't until Parker died a few years later and Chief uh, William uh, Redden took over, I think it was William Redden, um, that Gates then gets the, the, the green light to go ahead with this, this idea. Uh, he initially wanted to call it the Special Weapons Assault Team. Uh, a, a PR person within the LAPD said this might not be a good idea to have assault in the name. Uh, so they changed it to Special Weapons and Tactics, although you know, the mission didn't change much. Um, so. We then see a couple of high-profile raids, one in 1969, one in 1973. Uh, the one in 1969 was on the Black Panther, uh, a Black Panther holdout or headquarters in LA. The one in 1973 was on the Symbionese Liberation Army. And both of these were very uh, high-profile raids against groups that a lot of America were fairly terrified of. Uh, the SLA in particular had kidnapped Patty Hearst, uh, the newspaper heiress, and the entire country was sort of following this case very closely. Uh, and they thought that Patty Hearst was actually in the building that, was, that LAPD was raiding. Uh, so there were actually national TV crews there, and you can find videos online of reporters sort of ducking under cars as bullets are whizzing by. Um, 
And it really kind of propelled the idea of the SWAT team into the national culture and the pop culture. Uh, within a few years, uh, you had SWAT, the TV show. Here's the Milton Bradley SWAT board game. Uh, you had SWAT lunch boxes, uh, little die cast SWAT mobiles that your son could use to raid his sister's dollhouse. Um, and SWAT really sort of takes over in the pop culture. And by 1975, uh, basically every large city in the country has its own SWAT team. Uh, we go from one SWAT team in 1970 to about 500 in 1975. But throughout the 1970s, the SWAT teams were still uh, reserved for this uh, original purpose that Gates had in mind, which was you're using, with, you're responding to these uh, situations where lives are at immediate risk, right? So uh, the police are using violence to defuse an already violent situation uh, in order to save lives. Uh, so hostage takings and riots and uh, active shooter situations, bank robberies, uh, you get the picture. You've got a, a violent crime already in progress or about to be in progress. Uh, and even critics of SWAT tactics like me think that this is an appropriate use of police power in these situations, right? You're trying to save lives uh, and you have very little time to do so. Uh, so the other trend that's going on throughout the 1970s is Nixon's drug war. Uh, and Nixon in 1968, he ran on a very anti-crime platform. Uh, the idea, of course, was to appeal to the uh, silent majority, by which he mostly meant white people, um, and to basically get elected by exploiting white fear of urban crime. Uh, and there are a couple of uh, precipitating events that really helped Nixon, uh, and one of them, of course, happened here in Austin uh, with the Texas clock tower shootings by Charles Whitman. And uh, one of the, uh, you know, at the time, white America was basically watching black America riot on their TVs every night, uh, and that terrified them, but also, they could also, you know, remove themselves from that, right? They, moved, they were in the suburbs, uh, they were away from all this crime and violence, uh, it troubled them, but it wasn't something they had to worry about. Uh, after Whitman, uh, you know, Whitman opened fire on college students, right? Those could have been anybody's kids that were dropping on, on the, uh, the, the lawn out here. Uh, and it really kind of made crime uh, hit home in middle class America. Uh, Whitman himself was, you know, a former altar boy, Marine, you know, he played the piano, he was a good looking guy. Uh, you know, it, it really kind of struck home in the, in the suburbs that, you know, this was something that could happen anywhere. And so Nixon really drove this home in the campaign. One of the issues that he really pushed in the campaign was the no-knock raid. Uh, and this is a, there's a fascinating history behind the no-knock raid. Um, it wasn't something, this was not something that police chiefs were demanding. Uh, it wasn't something that criminologists were saying, you know, police need to have. Uh, the no-knock raid was actually the idea, the brainchild of a 28-year-old Senate staffer uh, who was charged with coming up with uh, ideas that Nixon could run on in his campaign that would basically exploit, again, middle-class fears of crime. Uh, so it was a political ploy, basically, and it, you know, given the ubiquity of the no-knock raid today, uh, it is of dubious origin. Uh, so Nixon declares war on drugs. Uh, he gets two no-knock raid bills passed, one uh, that would apply to federal narcotics agents across the country, uh, another that would apply just to Washington, D.C. Uh, the federal government, of course, has jurisdiction over Washington, D.C., and so Nixon basically wanted to use D.C. as its, his sort of test city or model city for these policies. A couple of interesting things happened then. In Washington, D.C., uh, they had a very progressive police chief at the time named Jerry Wilson. He actually refused uh, to use the no-knock raid. He said it was invasive, it was violative of, of civil rights and constitutional rights. Uh, and he said basically that uh, there was no drug, drug offense that was so important that police officers should be allowed to kick down doors in the middle of the night. Um, Interestingly, over the next few years, crime in D.C. actually went down while it went up in the rest of the country. Um, now, Wilson was a, had a lot of very good ideas. In fact, one of those mentioned earlier, uh, at the time when he took over the D.C. Metro Police Department in D.C., uh, two-thirds of the police officers were white in a city that was 70 percent black. Uh, most of them were recruited from outside of D.C., in fact, as far North Carolina and South Carolina. And one of the things Wilson really tried to do was uh, shift the balance, the racial balance of the police department and also recruit from within the city uh, was one of the, really one of his high priorities. Uh, Wilson was, did a lot of things right, actually. Uh, the other thing that happened, though, with the other bill was the national no-knock raid bill. Uh, and there it was used. And these narcotics officers, uh, federal narcotics cops across the country went nuts. Uh, they started just kicking down doors left and right. They were raiding houses where they didn't, without warrants. 
they were raiding innocent people, terrorizing people. Uh, and fascinatingly, and I, I kind of blew my mind when I found this in my research, uh, Congress called hearings and they brought victims of these raids forward to testify. Uh, the New York Times and the AP did investigations. They found dozens of cases where people had been wrongly raided. And Congress actually had, as late as 1972 anyway, uh, still had the capacity to show some shame and remorse uh, and reflection, and they actually repealed both of the no-knock raid laws. Uh, and in fact, not only that, they passed another law that made the federal government liable for any future wrongdoer raids by federal agents. Uh, it was really kind of a remarkable moment and showed that uh, the drug war was not yet completely uh, intractable. Uh, so throughout the 1970s, we see these two, uh, these two trends sort of continue on parallel tracks. You've got the SWAT team, the rise and, and spread of SWAT teams, you've got the drug war. But they don't really converge until the 1980s. Uh, and it's really in the 1980s that the two, the two trends converge, and this is when we start to see SWAT teams now routinely used to serve drug warrants. Um, and so where SWAT teams used, were previously used uh, to, to basically employ violence to defuse an already violent situation, now we see them used uh, to create violence and confrontation where there was none before, right? Now they're breaking down doors in the middle of the night uh, for people who are suspected of nonviolent consensual crimes. Uh, and that, the word suspected is important there too, right? Um, when you send a SWAT team to a bank, a bank robbery or a hostage situation or an active shooter, you are apprehending someone who has already committed a crime or is in the process of committing a crime, a violent crime. Uh, when you send SWAT teams into somebody's house in the middle of the night because you suspect there might be some drugs inside, uh, you are using violence against someone who has not yet committed, you're not sure they've committed a crime, right? SWAT is now being used as an investigative tool, not as a response uh, tool to save lives. Uh, and this is overwhelmingly how SWAT teams are used today. Uh, the vast, vast majority of the 100 to 150 SWAT raids per day in the United States uh, are used to serve warrants on people suspected of drug crimes. Uh, although that, that mission is changing, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, so during the Reagan administration, what we really see is a ramping up of the rhetoric. Uh, Reagan at one point declares illicit drugs a threat to U.S. national security. Um, we see dehumanizing of drug offenders. Uh, drugs are really painted as this existential threat, which is what you have to do in order to declare war on something, right? Um, I think it was Orwell who said, in order to, to, to declare war on an enemy, you first have to dehumanize them. We see people like William Bennett, who was Reagan's education secretary and then later becomes uh, Bush the first's uh, drug czar, uh, say things like, uh, he has no moral qualms with the idea of beheading drug dealers on television. Uh, at another point he uh, said, and I'll, I'll use his air quotes, uh, it's a funny kind of war when you give the enemy habeas corpus, right? So he's always already talking about suspending habeas corpus for the drug war. Uh, and then you get Gates, uh, who at one point said that drug users, not dealers, drug users, uh, should just be taken out in the street and shot. Uh, this is a position he later walked back when his own son was arrested for drug possession. <laughs> Twice, actually. So this is a, a quote from a sheriff in Clayton County, Georgia, uh, and the book is full of quotes like this. Uh, but we really see then this rhetoric trickle down to sheriffs, police chiefs, police officers, drug cops, uh, this idea that they're sol foot soldiers in a war. Uh, and this, is, this has been going on for a generation. Uh, incessantly, politicians have been telling cops that you're fighting a war, uh, that this is a battle. And you can see, I mean, when you think about it, this guy, this is guy is, this is how he's referring to his own constituents, right? The people who elected him, who ostensibly he's supposed to be serving. He's saying we should treat them basically like they're the enemy and we're storming the beaches at Normandy. Um, I'm going to read a, a, another quote to you that just went up this week. Uh, the Police One website, which is uh, kind of the go-to place on the internet for cops to rail about things, um, has uh, published a series of essays this week uh, specifically in response to my book. Uh, which is flattering in its own way, I guess. Um, and so one of the thing, one of the criticisms that uh, the a couple of the essayists levy against me is that uh, I'm wrong about this. That cops do cops are not seeing the world in terms of us versus them. They're not seeing citizens as the enemy. But here's one of the essays that actually went along with those essays that made that criticism. Uh, and it, the headline here is uh, "Police Militarization and an Argument in Favor of Black Helicopters." Here he says, uh, cops on the beat are facing the same dangers on our streets as our brave soldiers face in war. 
Uh, this is why commanders and tactical trainers stress the fact that uh, even on the most uneventful portion of your tour, right, referring to police officers' time on the job as a tour, uh, you can be subject to combat at a moment's notice. What is with this growing concept that SWAT teams shouldn't exist? Why shouldn't officers utilize the same technologies, weapon systems, and tactics that our military comrades do? We should, and we will. This, is, uh, this guy is the uh, SWAT commander, in, a sergeant and SWAT commander in the Sterling Heights, Michigan, uh, which I checked before I came on here. I had one murder last year. Clearly a war zone. A couple things Reagan also does. Uh, he creates, first he tries to bring the National Guard in to, to fight the drug war. He does that successfully. That's been happening ever since. Uh, he, the, he tries to bring active duty troops in. That actually is one of the few horrible ideas uh, in the 80s that did not actually make it into law. Uh, but he creates these joint task forces uh, which encourage the military to uh, share uh, information and share tactics with uh, local police agencies for, for drug inter interdiction efforts. Uh, the other thing he does uh, is he starts making Pentagon equipment available to police departments across the country. Uh, this is, you know, gear, uh, equipment that is uh, uh, gear built for war, for use on a battlefield, that's now being given to domestic police agencies for use on American streets and American neighborhoods and against American citizens. Uh, he then creates these, these anti-drug war grants that I talked about earlier, or anti-drug grants. Uh, so now, if you're a police chief or a sheriff, uh, you got all this cool equipment that the Pentagon just gave you, right? So you might as well start a SWAT team. Now you can either keep your SWAT team in mothballs until, you know, you get a terrorist attack in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, uh, you know, or a bank robbery, or you can start sending your SWAT team out on drug raids, which are actually going to generate revenue for your police department. Uh, so it was basically the perfect storm that Reagan created to uh, encourage the use of these kinds of paramilitary tactics for drug crimes. Um, this is a survey from uh, Professor Peter Kraska, who's a criminologist at U University of Eastern Kentucky. Uh, he's been surveying SWAT use for several years now. Uh, basically, he found that in the late 70s, there were about two to 300 SWAT raids per year in the US. Uh, by the uh, early 1980s, we were up to 3,000 per year. And by 2005, when he stopped conducting his survey, we were at 50,000 SWAT raids per year in America. Uh, so that's a, uh, about a 1,500% increase since the early 80s and about a 15,000% increase since the late 70s in the use of these kinds of tactics. These are all police departments, by the way. You've probably heard the story about C Steven Seagal who drove the tank into the guy's living room. Camouflage always gets me. I mean, what are the, you're, one, when you're conducting a raid, you, you, you really don't want to hide, and two, you're not raiding the forest, right? <laughs> So uh, this map, uh, we did this for Cato, uh, it's kind of poignant. Each of these little red pegs uh, is an actual innocent person who was killed in one of these raids. Uh, not, so they found nothing in these cases. No pot, no guns. Uh, they raided the wrong house and someone died. And I, there are about a little over 50, I think 52 of these cases now that I've found. So there are, are two really key moments that I want to emphasize here in the few minutes I have left where we kind of enter terrifying new territory. Uh, the first is in 1996, where, when California uh, legalizes medical marijuana in a ballot initiative, uh, and several states then follow suit. Uh, the Clinton administration responds by sending SWAT teams in to raid these medical marijuana clinics. Now, up until this point, the argument from police agencies for using this kind of force was that they were facing uh, a violent threat, right? This is for officer safety. Uh, drug dealers were heavily armed, they're, you know, violent, they would kill a cop on a drop of a dime. And there were counter arguments to all of those, right? But at least they were making the argument that we need this kind of a force because of the threat we're facing. Nobody be really believes that the hippie mom and pop couple that are running the pot shop in California are going to pull out an AR-15 from under the counter and kill a bunch of federal agents, right? Um, at this point, the federal government is using this kind of violence to make an example of people. Uh, these pot dispensaries are openly flouting federal law. Yes, they're operating openly. They're, they, most of them have business licenses. They're complying with state law. Uh, but they are openly flouting federal law. Therefore, we have to bring the boot down upon them. Uh, this is really kind of scary, right? And, and nobody really brought this up at the time. But the government was using violence to make a political point. And that really is not uh, something that we normally associate with the principles of a, a free society. And of course, we've seen this ever since. I mean, the raids on the Amish farms that are serving unpasteurized milk or selling unpasteurized milk products, 
Again, nobody thinks that the Amish are a threat to kill a bunch of USDA inspectors, right? Um, but they are openly f flouting federal regulations, even after repeated warnings, therefore we have to bring the boot down on them and make an example of them. Um, the next uh, uh, really kind of scary new territory we enter uh, is in the last probably six or seven years where we start to see SWAT get mission creep uh, and start moving out beyond even the drug war. We start to see raids on poker games. Uh, and actually in the last few years, I'm seeing more and more of this, we're now seeing SWAT raids to enforce regulatory law. Uh, so SWAT raids on bars, where they think there's an underage drinking going on. Uh, in Orlando, uh, they used a SWAT team to raid a bunch of barber shops where they, uh, that were basically licensure inspections to make sure the barbers were properly licensed to cut hair. Uh, now these were, make no doubt about it, these were drug raids, but they couldn't get enough evidence to get a search warrant so they turn it into a licensure inspection and now they can bring in the SWAT team without that pesky Fourth Amendment getting in the way. Um, but they we're seeing this over and over again and a lot of you may have read the story this week actually about the raid uh, here in Texas actually in South Arlington uh, on the organic farm, which again, this was actually a it was kind of in reverse. This was a code inspection. Uh, they thought that th these people you know, had uh, a bunch of standing water and tires. Uh, you know, it was a farm so they had a lot of stuff around and I guess the neighbors didn't like it. So these people were having a, a, a zoning battle with uh, the city, and the city responds by sending in a SWAT team to raid the entire place. They end up confiscating a bunch of okra and uh, blackberry bushes and tomatoes. It was, it was very, very dangerous okra. And actually, as someone who does not like okra at all, I had, a, I had to work up my outrage for that story. Um, <laughs> I'm going to end with uh, the Corey May story because I think it, um, it, it, there was a kind of a poignant moment in the story um, that hit, brought it all home for me a couple years ago. Corey May was uh, a 21-year-old uh, man at the time uh, who lived in Prentice, Mississippi with his girlfriend. Uh, they had just moved there a couple weeks earlier. They had an 18-month-old daughter, uh, and they had moved, you know, basically to start a life together. Uh, so Corey was home uh, by his, by, well, th with his daughter. Uh, on uh, the day after Christmas in 2001. Uh, his girlfriend was working at a factory. Uh, she worked the night shift at a chicken factory. Uh, so Corey was, was there with his daughter by himself. He wakes up at about 12.30 in the morning with the sound of uh, people, somebody breaking into his house. Uh, he's laying on the couch in front of the TV. He moves back to his bedroom uh, where his daughter's laying on the bed uh, and pulls out a, a gun that he kept on the nightstand lays down by his daughter, basically hoping that the noises would go away. Uh, they don't. They move around to the back of the house. The door flies open. A figure dressed in black, and it's night, of course, uh, runs into the house. Corey fires three shots from his gun uh, and kills uh, the person who had just broken into his home. Police yell, police, police, you've just shot an officer. Corey immediately drops the gun and surrenders. Uh, Corey had shot and killed a police officer. It was the son of the town police chief in this town. Uh, Corey was black, the cop was white. Uh, this was in Jefferson Davis County, Mississippi, uh, where race is sort of a suffocating part of everyday life. Um, now, there are two theories here, right? Either the state's theory, oh, Corey was arrested immediately, uh, beaten severely uh, and charged with capital murder, which is the intentional killing of a police officer. Um, now, there are two theories here, right? The state's theory was that Corey May was asleep, woke up, uh, looked out the window, saw that a team of cops was about to raid his house, uh, decided to take them on with his handgun, waited until they broke in, shot and killed one of them, and then immediately surrendered with bullets still left in the gun. Um, Corey's theory was, of course, that he had no idea they were cops. So he gets convicted, and I'm, I'm going to have to rush through the story, unfortunately, but he gets convicted... Um, of capital murder and he's sentenced to death. Uh, I found this case and started writing about it. Uh, long story short, a big firm in DC takes on, takes his case on pro bono. Uh, he gets the death sentence thrown out in 2006 and a couple years ago uh, he's finally, uh, he gets a new trial. The prosecutors allow him then to plead to manslaughter of felony, uh, but they give him time served, which means he'll get out of prison. So he reluctantly accepts the plea, pleads guilty to manslaughter, you know, he gets to go home to his kids, uh, but now he has a felony record. Um, so I was at the homecoming party uh, in uh, Mississippi, and uh, you know, it was a joyous, festive event. There's a huge soul food buffet. Corey's, you know, taking kids out for rides on a four-wheeler. Um, 
And you know, everybody was happy and, and, and celebrating, and this was, uh, there was a lot of joy in the air. Uh, but then I started talking to one of his attorneys, and it struck us odd that this was a joyous occasion, right? Um, here's a guy who had no criminal record, wasn't dealing drugs, you know, wasn't doing anything wrong, was put in this awful, awful position of having to decide if the men breaking into his home were criminals there to kill him or police there serving a warrant for some reason because he wasn't actually a drug dealer. Uh, he makes a, a mistake, a uh, mistake similar to the mistake cops have made in, in these raids all the time and aren't held accountable for. For this, the state tries to kill him uh, for 10 years, takes him away from his kid for 10 years. His kids actually had one other kid. Um, you know, and this was a guy who was defending his daughter, right? And this is a, you know, possibly politically incorrect to say this, but a part of the country where young black kids don't have father figures. Corey was a father figure to his kids. Uh, he, in fact, the the mother of the woman he knocked up out of marriage um, testified as a character witness at his trial uh, to give you an idea of what kind of father he was. Um, so he gets taken away from his kids for 10 years, you know, uh, taken out of their lives. Um, he's forced to plead to a felony, uh, you know, which means he's going to have to tell that to every employer for the rest of his life. Uh, he can't vote for the rest of his life. And a lot of other crap went down in this trial. They used this corrupt medical examiner. Uh, but basically, all this crap happens to this guy, and this is like one of the happy endings, right? This is one of the stories that we tell because um, this is the positive outcome. This is as positive as it gets. Uh, and it just struck me that, you know, if this is the, if this is the happy ending, uh, we've moved far, far, far away from that original uh, vision uh, that the founders had about, you know, the Castle Doctrine and the Fourth Amendment and what it takes to live in a free society. Thank you. It's interesting you bring that up because I've given this talk before to, to groups where there are people in the military in the audience, and on several occasions I've had them say, you know, I agree with everything, all your points, but they, they object to the term militarization because they say when we're raiding uh, suspected insurgents in Iraq and Afghanistan, we don't treat people as poorly as they get treated in drug raids in the U.S. Um, now, wh whether or not that's true, I have no idea, but I will say several people who have conducted those raids have, told me, have made that point to me. And actually, I mean, the police chiefs I've talked to who even agree with me on this issue uh, say that military hiring former vets is actually a good influence on police officers uh, because they have structure, they, mostly they, have college, they tend to have college degrees, but they're actually a good influence on the rogue kind of cowboy out of control cops in their departments. So there's a whole chapter in the book on reform um, and I don't I have time to get into all of them. I mean obviously the most important and influent, or effectual change we could make tomorrow uh, is to end the drug war. But, of course, that's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll let you all applaud that and then add that that's not going to happen. Um, but uh, you can read the book for, for the other uh, ideas. I got, I got a, uh, one more question here. Yeah, there's actually, that's a common res uh, retort to my arguments, and there's actually very little empirical evidence to support this idea that um, criminals are increasingly, you know, armed like third world armies. That's, you know... Uh, the Justice Department has done two studies, one in 97, one in 2005, and both found that uh, overwhelmingly the, the, the weapon used in homicides are tend to be handguns, small caliber, uh, same with weapons used to kill police officers. Drug dealers, drug dealers prefer smaller weapons that they can, see, can conceal. They don't like huge guns that they have to transfer from place to place that can be seen. Um, so I, don't, I just don't think there's a whole lot of, uh, of, of meat to that argument. I will say, that, uh, I mean, I think gun owners should be terrified about this trend. I mean, if you have cops conducting 150 of these raids a day, and they get you, if you're not doing anything wrong, and they get your house by mistake, you're dead, right? If you wake up and you, to armed men in your home, especially if you're not a criminal, right? Because then you're going to think, there, there's no way these are cops because I haven't done anything wrong. You're going to reach for your gun, and they're going to kill you. Um, I have not been, get, been able to get the NRA, NRA to get interested in this issue at all, I suspect because a lot of their membership are cops. Uh, but if, I, if you're a gun rights person, a Second Amendment person, as I am, uh, you should be uh, terrified about what's going on. Um, thank you.